Well, so tonight we start with these, um, as we look at these various names of God in the Old Testament. And it's interesting to, to look at this. There's 13 lessons. There's 12 different names that we'll consider as we kind of walk through this, this idea of what God is called. And, and I think that, I hope that you'll notice as we go through them, that through different time periods throughout the history of man, God refers to himself sometimes very specifically in different ways. And so not only do these names exemplify and show us different characteristics of God and show us more about his nature and show us who he is, but you'll notice that they are emphasized throughout the Old Testament in particular at different times when different things are happening with mankind, with his creation. And that also gives us some insight to what God is trying to show us and what he's trying to tell us about himself. And that's what I hope that we, are, we will be able to to gain from these things uh, as we go through this. And the first one that we're going, going to notice tonight is the idea of um, God as creator. And it may seem like a very simple concept. Uh, many of us here acknowledge that God created all the things that there are. But as we look through some of these passages tonight, hopefully we'll be able to have a, a deeper appreciation for really what that means. And ultimately, when you get to the end of each one of these lessons, what we want to be able to do is to look at what we have seen which is what God has told us about himself, we want to be able to look at that and see how it changes our life, how it changes our walk with him, how it brings us closer in some way for what it is that, that we can do before him. So that's kind of the goal as we, as we look through some of these things uh, in, in all of these different lessons. It's interesting when you go through the Old Testament in particular, there are much more than 12 different names that God is called by. Uh, these are the ones that, that we're going to study, but take a moment sometimes to do that. I used to have a list. I tried to find it tonight, but I couldn't. Um, it's in a file someplace uh, of probably 20 or 30 different names that God is called by that show a characteristic of who he is and why he has called those things. Something else you'll notice, I think, about this material as you look at it, there's not a lot of commentary by the author as far as um, material to read and then ponder, what he does is, gives us, is give us a synopsis of where he wants to go, and then it's mostly questions. And if you read through the introduction of this, the idea is to, to be able to look at the scriptures and for those to reveal the things about God that we want to study, but to generate discussion amongst us as to what we can take from that and what it means to us to be able to see who he is and uh, and how those things affect our lives. So that's, that's just kind of what approach we'll take with it. And so as we do that, when we start to think about, first and foremost, God as creator, and tonight I'm not going to get into some, some of the Old Testament uh, or some of the Hebrew spellings and what those names mean. We are going to look at that here in a couple of lessons. But tonight, just to, because of the magnitude of, of what we see in these verses, just to appreciate what the Bible specifically tells us and what we can learn from these verses about God as creator. So there were five different specific verses in Genesis that were mentioned in the lesson for us to look at. And, and the instruction was, and what I, I want to do with you tonight as we get started with this, is to look at these scriptures. Some of them are very simple. Some are ones we know well. But to look at them and to draw out of those, what is it that we can learn from God about this passage and why is that important so just starting off and looking at this if you turn over in your bibles to genesis the first chapter um, we're not going to read through chapters one and two tonight for the sake of time but we are going to read some in job when we get over there a little later uh, but but look here in these verses i've got some of them up on the screen and let's start off just just thinking about that what do you learn about God by reading a verse like this? This is a verse that we teach children to memorize very young in their lives. They, they, they memorize it back in the youngest of classes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What do we learn about God, whether it's one word or a phrase that you've come up with, from this verse? Let's start off with that tonight. It's 
kind of easy, but there's some depth to it as well. Anybody want to start off? What do you learn about God from this verse? Yes, sir. He was at the beginning. Okay. okay. So we find, that's one of the things we find in the beginning. There's very simple things to look at here and understand what that means. So I would say that that teaches us something about the eternal nature of God, or that God is timeless. Because as it describes it to us here, in the beginning, this is what God did. It, it supposes by, by how we understand language that God was already there. If he was the one creating these things, then he existed before that. And as we'll notice some other things tonight, we see the timeless nature of God. He's not affected by linear time as you and I are. Why is that important for us to, to understand to understand? Maybe not so much the, etern- the eternal nature of God. We'll talk about that a little more as we go through this. But the, that, it is, that God is timeless, as, I, as I'm calling it. Why, why would that be important? That's a great way of appreciating God's power and building prophecy. Okay. His ability to see beyond what we can see. Okay. And yeah. that helps cement the authority of the Bible at the end of the day. Okay, I think that's a great way to put it, that he's able to see beyond what we can see. So as you consider this, this is a simple concept, but at the same time it can be mind-boggling. And I'll describe it this way. You know, as, as a father of, of several children, as the children grow and they get to a certain point, Almost every one of them have come questioning some things that they've been taught for years because it's starting to click in their minds, how does this work? And one of the questions that seems to always come is, how did God, or how was God always there? And when you consider that that aspect of God, everything that we have, everything that we own, everything that we do, every decision that we make, Every plan that we have, all that we know has a beginning and an end. And for, to take even a finite mind, a mind that has a beginning and an end, and try to appreciate something that had no beginning and that has no end, I don't care how old you are or how wise you have become, that is not the easiest thing to do. Years and years ago, there was a preacher who tried to describe eternity. I remember it. It stuck in my mind. He tried to describe eternity by, by making some reference to, to, I think it was big metal spheres the size of the earth and an ant walking around it until he wore a hole in it and cut the spheres in half and then multiply that times 100, and that's like what eternity is. And you know, in some ways, we can start to grasp something that goes on and on and on, but something that had no beginning, that's hard. But when we think about the timeless nature of God, that allows him, beyond what we're able to think about, that allows him to to see all things and to know all things, and it speaks to his knowledge and to his authority um, and and different aspects of things like that. So that's something to appreciate in this very simple statement that in the beginning, this is what God did and and that he was there to do that. What else? Anything else that we we see from, from just this simple verse? Uh, he made not only the things that we can see, but also those that we can't see. Okay. He talks about creating the heavens and the earth. Um, you know, the, as this is penned for us here, it, it encompasses everything that we know. All that exists. Um, when we studied last year in Daniel and Revelation, we talked a couple of different times about things that are in realms that are beyond us talking about angels and where they exist and how they exist and and plans that God has and battles that go on. There are things that we don't know of, but God obviously created those things and is in charge of those things, has authority in those things. Anything else that we notice from here? Eric? The, The level of intelligence that God has in order to create and make something. Okay. We struggle even comprehending the small, finite levels of it. God is intelligent and wise and knowledgeable enough to make the complexities that we haven't even comprehended or even thought of yet. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it. I, I, I don't know how to add to that. That's, that. When you think about it, I mean, here's, here's three that I put with this one. Um, and, and you'll realize as we look through these, these five passages just tonight, you can put a lot of the things we're talking about under 
some of these different things because we see, the, we see how God crosses all barriers and all boundaries. But, you know, we learn, I think, especially from, from this verse, that God is all-powerful, the being that's able to create all of these things uh, in realms that we do not even know exist sometimes and to be able to, as we'll see later, to control them all, uh, to have the knowledge to be able to do that. And as Eric pointed out, we struggle as mankind to duplicate things that God has spoken into existence. And we desire to do some of those things, and we sometimes out of vanity think that we can and fail. Supreme knowledge, all-powerful, timeless. Um, you know, out of this short verse that we teach children to memorize, we learn this about the very creator of the universe. Genesis 1-4 is another one that he said. Yes, sir? No matter how you, no matter how you look at it, it had to have a starting. Mm -hmm. He said that God, that, that the East Graham got up and walked. Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. There's always... Always what? I didn't hear the last thing you said. What was the last thing you said? Right, and, and God is the one that did, that did that. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, as we, as we challenge uh, friends of ours who, who look for a different way for things to have begun, really when you go back, they have to find something to start it all. Uh, and clearly God is, is uh, through all that we see in his majesty, has done that. Let's look at this one. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated, and God separated the light from the darkness. Anything different here that, that comes to mind as we consider what God is starting to do? Mm -hmm. You know, um, all the scriptures that God has given us, only, I mean, the one thing it tells me is how great he is. And he tried so many times, especially in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. to show everything about him. Okay. I'm trying to tell people everything about him. Sure, it's shown in lot in lots of different ways. Yeah. yeah, but they didn't a lot of times want to accept it. But I think uh, first verse, uh, I think reading that would tell you that how great God is and okay. His powers, what He can do. Okay. So I just think it's He's just giving us you know, some information that we can find out just how great He really is if we have. Faith. Sure. It's, you know, as you look through these things, um, especially in these first couple of chapters, we start to peel away layers and see the depth of what God is. I hope that's what you'll see as we go through, through some of these things. So, you know, when you look at this, think about this statement. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. We may take that for granted, but God, as he is creating this and deciding what the boundaries are going to be, with the things he is creating, he is the one who decided what we have come to know as something so common and that we expect. And you think about how our bodies work and how our society works uh, and, and how out of whack things get when light and darkness don't do what they're supposed to do. Go back through history and read what happened when they didn't understand things happening with eclipses and, uh, and different weather, weather difficulties, storms, and, and how that threw them off, and they began to think about mystical things and, and what was going on. We're thrown off when the very thing that the Creator put in place doesn't operate as it should. He had the wisdom to know that. So we see God's wisdom in that. We also see foresight. Um, it's something else that I thought about here. You know, God saw that the light was good. God is able through his timeless nature, through his, his supreme knowledge, through his great, his majestic wisdom to know what is best until the end of all things. We struggle with that sometimes, don't we? Sometimes we talk about trying to see the big picture, being able to look ahead to see what's going to come. We think about our actions sometimes that may, be, that may seem so small and insignificant, but, but realize years later what has come with those things or, or decisions that we make and how those change things. We see God's foresight just in a simple passage like this to show us what he's able to do. Mm -hmm. Something that I, I wondered about for, forever. Okay. okay. He said, he separated the light from the darkness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you read on down here, and then he, then he, he said he made two lights, two one greater light to the day and the night. When did he do the separation of the light and the darkness before he had the 
sun and the moon that would give us light in the Well, with, without getting into a lot of it here, we may have to talk about it afterwards, but, but um, you know, as, as you go through the, the different days of creation and you see, uh, you see God start with the very big things and, and he keeps separating, he's dividing, he's, he's creating. Um, so, you know, in this instance here in, in verse 4, as he talks about separating uh, the light from the darkness, um, calls the light day and the darkness called night. Um, you know, there's, there's a separation there of the void that was. Um, and then he goes on to talk about, uh, you know, the sun and the moon and putting those in place. Um, you know, those, those are things that we look at today that, that provide us light. But in general, light and darkness, uh, you know, a, a difference that existed because God created it to be such. Um, we look out into space and we we try to define why things exist the way that they do, and we base it on that this is what has made this, and this is what has made this. Realize the bigger picture of God starting with nothing and beginning to, to break things down. Yes, sir. A comment on that. I think this is a reference to God's power. He created the concept of light before yes. light sources were created. Like the, that's... How does one even do that? My right. human brain cannot understand. That, exactly. You said it better than I did. That's what I was trying to come up with, the word concept, and I missed it. Yeah. The, it, God creates the, the concept of light and darkness before you know, the fact that there is something that, in our minds, generates that. Um, it just shows more about who he is. Eric? And even the way he defines that as good, mm -hmm. how do I define good without God explaining what good is? Absolutely. I mean, he's, yeah. Even in, even in a statement, in a sentence like this, he's defined what good is. He's right. Like, I've made this. This is good. Right. And that's one of the things I wanted us to, to be able to see from here. Thanks. Thanks for leading me into that. Um, judgment. You know, we see God's his ability to to create and to show us what proper and good judgment is. We base judgment today on what we consider to be justice, what we consider to be right and wrong, and and. Our sense of right and wrong hopefully is guided by what we learn from God, but sometimes uh, humanity gets that out of whack as to what right and wrong really is. We see the ultimate example of sound judgment that goes along with foresight and wisdom. He saw that the light was good, uh, and God has declared that, and that gives us then grounds as we start going through things to understand the difference between right and wrong, to understand what is good and what is not, uh, and something as simple as this. And throughout God's Word, then, we'll see from this point forward the idea of light being good and walking in the light and abiding in darkness and what that means. Um, so we see these things from the very beginning. Any other quick thoughts before we go on to the next verse? Yes, Paul. I've always looked at this second portion come to you with light and dark as he had a plan. This is what set the plan in motion. Okay. It was his first year, was his first. You have to have two some you have to have something. Mm -hmm. So he had heavens and the earth. Now to get light and dark separated, that set his whole plan and process in motion. Okay. And and, and also keep this in mind. We try to make sense and understand it um, and appreciate what it is, but we're also dealing with someone who's far wiser and has much more foresight and is timeless. We'll do the best we can, and he's revealed what we need, but you know, that, those are things for us to, for, to remember. The next, the next verse that he mentions here as uh, we move along through this is he, he talks about verses 7, verses 9, and verse 14. So as you look at those verses here, and God, notice some of the key words that you see appear in all of these verses. It helps us understand what we want to learn from God here. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 14, and God said, let there be light and the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be signs for, and for seasons for days and years. And I think I cut off the, and it was so, in verse 14 when I copied that up there. Um, if you look at, look at verse 14 here, at the end of it, no, okay, it doesn't say that in verse 14, it's in the next verse. But what do we see here in, in these verses that show us something about God? 
See any common themes as we read through those verses and as you look back through them? What are some things that we might notice about God here? Mm -hmm. Okay. He, he speaks it and it happens. That's a good synopsis, yeah? Anybody else want to add to that? Yes. This is a very critical point, and I think this is one of the best verses in the Bible. Uh, the last one, like 14 and the third one, 15. Mm -hmm. When God's talking about time in the Bible, mm -hmm. he's talking about time from a human perspective most of the time. Okay. And that is so critically important when we're trying to describe the Christian worldview. Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying, yeah. Um, especially when we consider that we just talked about that God is timeless. Um, so referencing, referencing things here for in consistent ways that we understand and that we reference as well, um, in doing so, showing us who he is and showing us how he has an order to things uh, is, is something else to think about. A couple of them here, John. Well, God blessed us with the ability to create things on our own. Sure. But we can't think right right exactly exactly so yeah and, and so everybody's wheels are turning here a little bit about what these phrases show us in these verses here eric did you have something the, the fact that, that god has as part of making this creation he commands what he has made mm -hmm. to act in a certain way and it is so and right it acts in that way that he's that he's expected and so you don't see that the earth that he has made um, re rebelling against him, you see it doing exactly what you expected. Right? Excellent point, because that's going to come up as we make some application here about this uh, at the end of the lesson. Very good. A couple others here. Andrew? His, uh, his verb that he starts with is let. Mm -hmm. He's granting permission for okay. the waters to do this thing that he wants it to. Absolutely. He could have made it another way, but not only is he making the waters, he's allowing the waters to be water. Right, right. I think we're all on a, uh, we're on a great track here in showing where this, where this is leading here. You notice some of the phrases. I just copied some of them out of these verses here. God made, God said, God said, and, and that idea of letting it or allowing it to happen, and, and it was so. Uh, and, you know, the, the verse 14 one, actually, that comes here in, in another verse. Sorry, I've, I've got that up there that way. But we get the point here. As you look at all of these things, there's just there's really one thing that I would sum this this up in as we as we consider what this does. God has all authority. He can he commands by his very thoughts and words for something to happen. And I like how some of you have put some of these different things. Um, you know, he allows it to happen, and and the earth obeys. Um, and and we'll we'll see, you see some of the. The beauty of those things, when you, when you read the, the verses in Job and in Psalm that were in this lesson as well, um, about how the earth is personified in its obedience to God and that it is a part of, in a sense, a part of him because it is his creation and how he uses those things for his every purpose and his every whim. He has all authority to do that. And that's demonstrated here by these passages. Other thoughts or comments? I didn't mean to overlook anybody. Yes. Um, more holistically, but throughout this entire section, I think you see the love that God has mm -hmm. uh, in that, you know, he created this place before he created man. Okay. And just with the way that I end up doing things, unless I'm extraordinarily deliberate about it, it's very easy, it would be very easy for me to understand, see man being there and then being like, oh man, I should probably create something for him to live in. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Different mindset, right? Right. And instead, it's very deliberate, you know. Before you, people have a child, they typically plan for it because they love that child and they want to make mm -hmm. sure that when the child gets here that it has a room and a crib <laughs> and all the things that children... Create, create an environment for it, for it to, to, to be nurtured in and... Yeah, and, and, to, and to be able to succeed in. Um, I appreciate you helping me segue into this next point. Thank you. Uh, so if you look at the next verse that's on the, on the paper, what does this tell us here? Um, there's a couple of things, and I guess we'll get to what, what I was saying here about what you were talking about here in just a moment. But first, notice this. He says, and then God said, 
Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Here's a new element in this account of creation. This is the first time we have seen a certain description. What, what do we see here in these verses about God? God is a plurality. is more than one. Okay. We see a different nature, don't we? Yeah, I struggled with what word to use tonight <laughs> to talk about that. But yeah, he says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. There's something else that's telling us and showing us about God, isn't it? That he's different than, than all of us. So let, let's, con, let's consider that here for just a moment. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. This, we see the fullness of God is what is the way I termed it, but the plurality, um, different terms are used that man has put on it, but we see the fullness of God here. And, you know, I've got Father and Son and Spirit here. Without having a lesson on how the three dwell together and, and, yet, and yet different, consider passages that show us that this is, in fact, the case. We often think about God, especially in the Old Testament, um, we think about God the Father. Um, and that's where our minds mostly go to. And there are times as we look throughout the Old Testament that it talks about God the Father or it prophesies about God the Son or mentions the Spirit of God and, and, and discusses those things individually. But, but we also notice in this account of creation that shows us the fullness of God. For instance, when you think about Christ and his part that he plays here in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Uh, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Here's a passage that shows us or points us to the fact that Christ and God, as we would term it, are together in this effort, in this, in, in this creative effort. And uh, there's some other passages we'll look at as well. Alex? Um, really quick, just a quick thought. Mm -hmm. um, God gave us the perfect way to describe how it's three beings and one body. Okay. You know, whatever term you want to use. Mm -hmm. Look at us. Are we our body? Are we our spirit? Are we our soul? Yeah. Are we our intellect? Right. Sure. Right. Right. Something that that is difficult sometimes to wrap our minds around because we don't think of ourselves sometimes that way and we f or we're focused on certain things but but if you do think about it there are times when you are you are focused on something inward versus something outward um, and we see this about God and like I said uh, tonight I'm going to point you to the fact that the Bible supports and shows the fullness of God from the beginning um, here's one passage you know another one here's in, in John uh, the first part of John, John chapter 1, the first four verses there, in the beginning was the Word. And there's, there's a reference to Christ. These two verses are referencing Christ. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. It's hard to get more plain than that about the existence and the nature of Christ. And you think about the Spirit of God. Sometimes that people talk a lot about God the Father and God the Son. Think about the Spirit of God and how that's referenced at different times. In verse 2 that we didn't read this evening, about the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. Or here's a couple of passages in Job 33 or, or in Psalm that reference the Spirit of God and, and tie it to the creation or, or things as they are created. So, we see in this passage, in, in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we see the fullness of God. And that's a large aspect of, of God that we want to understand. What else in that passage do, you, do we see about God? That was just the, the first phrase. There was the rest of verse 26 and verse 27 that also show us something about God. And uh, I'll kind of tie it to the comment that we had over here about, about how he views and looks at man. Anything else that you notice there? Yes. Okay, yeah, there's a difference there, a clear difference, isn't there? And as you consider what you, consider what you see there, 
I've termed it this way. It's, there's an unparalleled care and love for man. And just like what was being described over here, God prepared the earth. He prepared all things that were there. And then what did he say after he created man in verse 27? Or in verse, the last part of verse 26 and verse 27. What did he say about man and his relationship to the rest of creation? These things weren't created for us to enjoy. They are created for us to take care of. Okay. Yeah, he, he talks about the idea of, of having dominion over those things um, and setting us apart from those things, caring for us or, or showing, showing his love for us in the way that he made these things um, for us to, to be a part of. There's responsibility that goes with that, though, and I think that's borne out as you, as you look through some more of these verses here. His desire is for our benefit and that we are going to rule over these things, but also... Look at the wisdom of his planning that you see here as well. Um, and, I, and I've got on here man's opportunity for loyalty. As you look at the, at the rest of verse 26 there, he says, and let, him, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the creeping things uh, that creep on the earth. God is giving man a charge here as well. And he gives Adam a charge as you read on into chapter 2. Here's an opportunity for man, who has been created by God and the recipient of God's love and care, to now make a choice to obey their creator. Is man going to do what God has put him on earth to do? And when you read about in chapter 2 and chapter 3 about how sin enters the world, these things were created by God and put there, and man had a choice to make. God, in his wisdom, made this opportunity for man to be able to choose loyalty, to choose to worship him, to give themselves to him, the whole idea of free will, we see all of that as we think about God making man different and making him in his image. So there's a lot we can talk about there, but uh, as we move on, um, the last thing I think that we see in this verse here is um, that in verse 27 it says, so God created man in his image. God did just what he said he would do, we see in that God's faithfulness and his determination is what I've termed that there. Um, any other thoughts on this verse before we move on? Yes? I think going back to uh, man's opportunity for loyalty, I think you see a lot of love in that as well. Sure. You know, not only was it wise planning, but you think about the love that it would take to create people who you know are going to reject you. Okay. Who you know are going to spend their lives, and as a result, eternity rejecting you and away from you and yet you have enough love to say I'm still going to give you life and I'm still going to give you the same benefits that everybody else has and still give you the same opportunities to love me knowing you're going to reject me. But the, the idea of being given free will to make a choice like that um, is when you really think about the, what we term sometimes as the human spirit um, and, and the, the drive to do things, that's given to us by God. And the ability to make a choice and to do right or wrong uh, is a great gift that he has given us. Um, there's a lot of things that we can say about that. But in, in all of this so far, as we've gone through this first chapter of Genesis, look at all of the things that we've been able to see about who God is as creator. And, and we tie that back to, to this lesson that he is creator. He is the master designer of all of these things. And we'll, we'll see what that means for us here as we kind of wrap, uh, wrap our thoughts up here in a few minutes. So in Genesis 2 is the other verse that, that was in the lesson here. Um, talks about the naming of things. And he says there, the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it up in, in, closed up in its place with flesh. What do we see about God here? Yes, sir. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think we see, we see genuine concern for that which he has created, and we see unselfish love. Um, God is, and this is the, this is, the idea of unselfish love is eventually what we see in Christ and what he is willing to give, and it's what we're told to, to learn to have and to develop. It starts in the very beginning with God, and he saw something that man needed and was willing to give it to him, 
for what was in his best interest. That's what unselfish love is, is being able to give someone something that is in their best interest. I was listening to another preacher one time, and he pointed out something I loved about this passage. Okay. Let's consider for a second what it doesn't say here. It does not say that Adam was lonely. Okay. okay. And that's, that is very important. Yeah. Adam was with God in a way that no other human sure. aside from Jesus ever was. Sure. Did Adam need Eve? No. But God saw fit that Eve be created so that Adam could fulfill his purpose more mm-hmm. fully. Right, and the, the idea of here that uh, someone who is suitable for him in that way and to, and to be someone who, you look at the word, help me to be someone who is, uh, be able to work with him, work together with him. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, which goes back to, to God being the wise master planner of all of these things. Um, so there, there's lots of things like that that we see. There's so much you can draw out of this um, just in, in understanding God as, as creator. When you, you consider some of the other passages that we were asked to read, um, I thought we might have time to read through Job 38 and 39 tonight, but we do not. Um, I appreciated all the, the good thoughts that you have had. But turn over there for just a moment. Hopefully you took the time to read that but before we had class tonight. If you didn't, please do that. Go home and read Job 38 and 39 and appreciate just the magnitude of what God is showing Job here, um, you know, based on their situation. And you look at the questions that, that we're going through here. And the overall, the author says, what is the overall point of God's argument um, in Job 38 and 39? And why is this something that we need to recognize? If you've read through that, you know, what would you say God is trying to show Job in this argument that he's making here in these two chapters? Thanks. Sure, okay. That's one way to put it, right? Yeah, the, the, how small is, the, is, is Job compared to, I, I can't even describe it. Uh, you know, I've put on the screen here, God is the ultimate designer of everything. And there's so many applications we can make about that. Any product that you have, anything that comes, that comes to be that, that humanity has a part in, the designer is the one who, who generally is, is someone who knows the most about it and knows what its purpose is, what it's supposed to do, knows the intricate details of it. And think of God as the designer of everything, and he lays that out so beautifully here, here in this book. Yes, sir? The questions here talks about theism. Mm-hmm. And this, these two chapters firmly refute that philosophy. Sure. Um, I think there's an argument to be made that God's physical laws that he created allow this universe to keep functioning a certain Mm -hmm. way, whether he's there or not. But here, God is telling Job, whether you know I'm there or not, I'm there. Even when there are no humans, just where there is a speck of matter I've created, I am there keeping watch over it and paying attention to it, making sure it's still doing what I designed it. Right, right. And if you haven't been impressed with anything else, uh, that you read tonight, be impressed with these chapters as you just start to take out just snippets of them and, and, and see how God shows this to Job in so many ways. Because he is the ultimate designer, he rules all things, he has all authority over it, he has all power, he has all knowledge. And as, as he describes things like, you know, setting the boundaries for the stars or for the sea, um, as he describes the, the, the cycles of life that are going to exist with all of the, the animals that he's created and how he sets those and manages those and keeps those in place, there are things that are happening that God describes here that we don't give a second thought to. We expect that that's how nature is going to go. God says, I have done that. And he's telling Job, appreciate that about me. And, and not, God's not being vain here, even though he has every right to be. It's, it's simply the fact of what it is. He can do that. I cannot. Job can't. And, and that's, what, that's what he's wanting him here to understand. So whatever men may learn in their short time here, we, we have come to know a lot of things. Nothing. Nothing compared to what the great planner and creator possesses and controls in this universe. And, and we need to remember that. And so as you look at these first three questions about Job, clearly God. 
as the creator has the ability and the knowledge and the, mo- and the wisdom to, to not only set things in motion, but to maintain control uh, and to know what all of those things are. And so, you know, the, if you have opportunity to read Psalm, we didn't get to that, that verse tonight, some of those other passages, you know, that, that again shows in a different aspect, shows how God uses the things that he has made to, to, to speak to man, to, to show things about himself, beautiful passages that, that enable us to understand who God creator is. And, and really, if you, you put yourself in the place of Job, as Job, who was is defined in the first part of, of Job chapter 1, as what? Remember what Job is called as, it's, as he is described by, by God? Any aspect of Job stand out? Blameless is what I was looking for. Blameless. And yet he, a, bl- a man called by God, blameless, gets to the point in life where he has to question what's happening. We're going to get there sometimes. And when that happens, even this blameless man God really just kind of opens up and says, who are you (laughs) compared to what I have done? And and wants us to be able to appreciate that. Let's end, uh, you know, Romans 1, 18 through 32. We don't have time to read it all. but, But the question was, what happens when man fails to recognize God as creator? Anybody want to take a couple of last thoughts on that? Yes. It's unhealthy. That's, that's a good way to put it. That's right. That's right. It's unhealthy. What else? Mm-hmm. But it's very arrogant of humans to think that we can do whatever we want and not face the repercussions. Absolutely. So the brilliant thing is that God gave us the choice and allows us to reap the consequences of what we sow. But right? if we go through life ignoring our Creator, He's going to ignore us. Mm-hmm. Our sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's strong language there in Romans chapter one as Paul is talking about the, the consequences of those who have rejected God. And uh, just, if you just look at the last part of, last part of that in the, last, in the last part of Romans chapter 1, down around verse 28 or 30, um, you know, as, he, as he bears out what it means to be someone who has looked around, and Paul acknowledges that it's evident who God is just by the very things that exist. And I think we can say that as we've looked at what he said to Job tonight. Um, you know, and he starts there in verse 28, and it goes downhill from there. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And starts to talk about what they have been filled with, which are not the things that, that God created and brought into the, to existence. They're things that came from man when he violated God, God's will. Malice and strife and murder and and maliciousness, and haters of God, and so on and so forth. And he doesn't stop with just people who do those things, but those who also will not acknowledge who God is, and those who approve of people who don't do that as well. So, lots of things to think about. Next week, we're going to talk about God as covenant maker. Um, So grab lesson two, if you would. I really appreciate your comments tonight, uh, and your input, and we'll talk about God as covenant maker next week. Thank you.